The same thing can happen tomorrow. We are studying these five uh, divisions of plants today. There is stuff you need to know about each one that could be on the quiz. Um, these names are big and you have to learn them and it's good to use note cards and that sort of thing. And these five, together with the five we just learned from yesterday, um, make it uh, a lot of things to learn. If you didn't learn it last night, you need to get on it. Okay? So we're on page 617. Oh, yeah. Do what? Okay, can we do this now? She couldn't call Page 617. 21.4, we're talking about, whoops, let's go back and take a look at this. We've already done, again, plants evolved. The first plants were non-vascular. Okay, go away, I'm the film person. The first types of plants were non-vascular that include liverworts, mosses, and hornworts. We learned about those. When we say non-vascular, we mean that they don't have any tissue for transporting materials up and down the plant. Um, after that came vascular tissue, which are these tubes inside the plant. And these first types of vascular plants, ferns, horsetails, and club mosses, are known as non-seed vascular plants, meaning they use spores to reproduce. Spores are little tiny cells that float through the air or in the water and land somewhere and can end up growing a new plant. We'll study those life cycles later. Maybe in your reading you see the words sporophyte and gametophyte, and those have to do with the life cycles of these things, which we'll learn about next chapter. So you can see the okay, you um, the, uh, the next thing that evolved were seeds. Seeds are containers that hold the baby plants, um, the embryos. Uh, the embryos packed in seeds allow the, all of these plants to kind of not be so dependent on water. Ferns and horsetails and club mosses are still dependent on water because they have no way of protecting their embryo from drying out, their baby plants. So they need to be in wet places. But all of these things can grow in drier climates. So seeds were a development that allowed plants to grow in drier climates. And there are five groups of seed plants. Cycadophyta are the cycads also known as sega palms. I don't know if you've ever seen those, but we have those out here. Out front, I'll show you pictures. Neophytes are called the joint firs. You've probably never seen one of those. They're pretty rare. Um, so most of them located in Africa. The ginkgo fights or the ginkgos. Uh, you may have heard of ginkgo biloba or a ginkgo tree. Um, they have these, these fan-shaped leaves. You see them in Japanese gardens a lot. You also see them in big cities because they're very pollution, pollution resistant. The coniferophyta are the pines and other cone-bearing cone trees. You see those all the time. Pine trees are an example. Um, spruce trees and fir trees. Coniferophyta. Any tree that has cones on it. Up here. Argo. Graham and Taylor over here. And then anthophyta are the flowering plants. All the plants that produce flowers for reproductive for reproduction. And the anthophytes are the most successful variety of plants in the world. If you look out the window, most of the plants you see are anthophytes. All the grass, the bushes that produce flowers. The oak trees, some trees, uh, magnolia trees, any tree that produces a flower is anthophyta. When you say a con 
conifers or like cone bearing? You mean like podcasts? Like podcasts, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. All oh, right, I have that picture uh, from you. There's a Sega bomb right there. Do it. Yes, let's start with Cycadophyta. Our first division. <coughs> These cycads. Now, cycads also contain cones. Um, the cones are organs that produce uh, sperm and eggs. And the cycads actually have their cones on separate plants. You have male plants and female plants. The male plants produce these special cones that release pollen type things, which are basically sperm cells. Sperm cells are released, they float through the air, they land on the female plant. And the female plant produces cones that have eggs inside them. And the sperm cells travel through the air, get into the egg cells, and fertilize the plant. So cycads produce sperm cells inside of what we call a pollen grain. You've seen pollen in the air covering the ground in the spring. It's all over your car. It gets in your nose. A pollen grain is a container that holds sperm cells. Sperm, sperm cells are inside a pollen grain. So that's a lot of sperm. That's right. And they produce it in such huge amounts because the wind has to blow it from one cone to another. And so, the cycads are kind of probably the earliest plants that formed cones. The natural habitats for cycads are the tropics. They came before plants that had flowers. And here you see a picture of one. Y'all have seen these outside, right? There's some of our students next to Oh you recognize those students? Uh, I don't know, what's that? Is he on the ground? That's the you're talking about? This is it. This is a side cat. Yeah. You seen those on the way to lunch out there? Like every single sure. picture. What grade are they? There's some more students next to the side cat. <laughs> more students next to the side cats. We should go get our picture next to the cycad. Let's do it right we now. should. We okay. will at the end of the period. More students next to cycad. Yeah, Can I just email it's both of them blood. to you at once then? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. More students next to the cycads. Was it really that cold? Yeah, <laughs> this is the wrong day. We just took this picture. When? That should be 2009. Yeah, because TJ is always that check. And those ones left. Mills always worse than either. Is that Okay. So those are your side cats. Or your Sega Punk. Now, uh, the Nido fights. This is a Nido fight. It has a, it's kind it's, uh, uh, species name is Wellwitschia. And basically this neophyte, these things are real long lived. This thing will live for 1,500 or 2,000 years. This is a desert plant. You see all the sand around it. And it has these thick leathery leaves. And these brown things on the top are its cones. And once again it produces cones that release sperms, pollen grains, or produce eggs. And the pollen grains will float through the air and hopefully land on another plant. And then the sperm can fertilize the eggs and produce seeds. And the seeds will be scattered by the wind and will land somewhere and grow into a new plant. These Wellwistia are have real long underground stems that go way down into the desert until they reach water, sometimes hundreds of feet. If you ever find a plant like this, you know that there's water way down below it. So 
So have you ever? ever? So if I'm ever lost in the desert, I should start digging around. Right well, it might be hundreds of feet, so you may Five not be minutes. able to dig that deep. Unless the plant's dead, they didn't find one. That would suck. Um, have you ever heard of ephedrine? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a compound that's like, uh, kind of like caffeine. And um, it's produced by some of these uh, neophytes. There are three different uh, genera of them. Um, Ephedra is one, Netum is another, and Wellwichia is the other. This is this doesn't show the one that may I don't have a picture here of the ones that make ephedra. Drew, are you on the right page? Oh yeah. Six eighteen? Yeah. You look like you don't even have your book open. No, I'm not on the right page, though. No. Okay. <laughs> open to the right page. Gosh, I was on the right page. Page six eighteen. <laughs> Wow, nice, man. Right? In your butt. Open it up. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah it's exactly the same thing. Uh, it's <laughs> okay, ginkgo phyta. You may have heard of ginkgo biloba. It's the only surviving species of ginkgo phyta. And they have these fan shaped leaves. You see them right here. If you ever see leaves like this, they're shaped like a fan, like if you were going to fan yourself off. Delicious. Um, they're, they actually, again, they, they have separate, um, separate sexes, so you have male plants and female plants. Um, everywhere you see the, uh, the ginkgo trees, um, the ones you'll see are male because the female plant produces a cone that's really foul smelling. <coughs> it smells so bad you can't stand to be within 50 feet of it. And so they only plant the, uh, the male plants. The uh, ginkgo plant is extremely pollution tolerant, Graham. He is why? Pick your head up. Yeah. All the way up. The plant is pollution tolerant. Do you have your book? It's at my house. Um, the ginkgo plants are pollution tolerant, so they plant them in cities because, you know, the smoke from the, the exhaust from cars and trucks and things won't kill them. Do they stay green? Yeah, they do. Well, actually, they they can turn yellow. Uh, here, I have a picture. Here's what how they look when they're green. This is the foul-smelling female cones, or these actually are seeds produced by the cones. There used to be a cone there, and now there's well, seeds there. How they, 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 they only put the males, okay. the male okay. trees in the cities. The males don't smell bad, but the females do. So they don't plant the females. You can find the females growing naturally in the wild. They occur naturally in Japan. Bro, how big are these ginkgo? There's me by a ginkgo tree. Also known as a maidenhair tree. And you see these leaves have turned yellow. So that, I think they change color with the seasons. Is it a man or a lady tree? This is a male. Okay. Or else his face Bro. would be like... Bro, so in the male ginkgo trees, like, release the spores? So it's like, the, in, like in cities, they like Release the sperm, so, uh, pollen grains, okay. not Bro. spores. So it just, tries, it just blows it, the female that might be... Hundreds of miles Absolutely, yeah. And that's why they have to create so much yeah. pollen. Yeah, bro, where'd you go for Christmas last year? That was in uh, Los Angeles at uh, the Botanical Garden in Los Angeles. Nice. Oh, I have a question. Yes. Did you decide where we are having our tests? Um, I hadn't think about that. Let's look at it right at the end here. Monday, maybe? When we're having our tests. Okay, so those, those are ginkgos, and again, there's only one species of ginkgo left. They, all the rest of them have gone extinct, and that's ginkgo biloba. Oh, and by the way, the ginkgo biloba uh, leaves produce a chemical that's, again, it's kind of like caffeine. And if you take it, it's kind of a medicine. It's used to help lower blood pressure, and it kind of wakes you up. And so you can buy them at, like, convenience stores. It's called ginkgo biloba, and it's a little pill you can take. Um, that uh, 
uh, you know, they sell kind of like kind of like five hour energy or something. Like that. Now, the coniferophyta. These are your uh, like your pine trees, fir trees. Um, most of them are evergreen trees. Most of them have little spines as their leaves, um, needles, you know, pine needles. Um, the needles are covered with a wax-like coating called cutin, and that helps the leaves keep from losing water to the outer environment. Um, this is actually a fir tree, Douglas fir. They all have cones. The way they work are, the, uh, the pine trees out there work like this. The male cones are on, uh, are on the higher branches. I'm sorry, the female cones are on the higher branches, and the male cones are on the lower branches. And the reason why is because the pollen grains are so light, they can blow from the bottom branches up to the, to the higher branches on other trees. And the female cones make those little helicopter, have you ever seen those little helicopter things? Those are the seeds. So the female cones hold the eggs, and the female cones open up and release the little seeds that float down like this and are blown by the wind. So, if the, so the female cones are on real high branches so that the seed will travel far from the adult tree and land a good distance away from it so it'll probably be in the sun and can grow. Some questions back there? I, have we said that? Have we talked about that before? I don't know. Have we? It just sounded familiar. Yeah. I don't know. Not all of the cones are, are woody cones, like on a pine tree or a fir tree. Some of them have berry-like cones, and some of them have fleshy cones. But all the cones do the same thing. They produce pollen grains or eggs that can get fertilized and form seeds. So those are your conifera fungi. Here's a big forest of conifers. Once you get one tree growing, it'll drop seeds, and more trees will grow around that, and they'll drop seeds, and more trees will grow around that. And over several thousands of years, you form a huge forest that way. So you have these big forests of, of pine trees or fir trees. Um, most of the pine trees around here have been planted. They didn't form naturally into forests. Um, most of the trees around here have been cut and then we planted pine trees because pine trees uh, have good wood you know, that we can use for telephone poles and furniture and things like that. And they grow very quickly. Most of the forests around here, if they hadn't been cut, would be oak trees, which are flowering plants. I love oak trees. We'll talk about the flowering plants next. You ever seen a redwood forest? Yeah. National parks were established to protect the natural heritage of the land. Giant redwood groves exist only on the western slopes of California's Sierra Nevada. The giant redwood is Sequoia giganteum, a giant relic of the Jurassic period. One of the oldest living organisms on Earth, estimated to be up to 3,000 years old, is the General Sherman tree, a giant sequoia in Sequoia National Park. It is 275 feet tall, almost as tall as the Statue of Liberty, and has a base trunk circumference of 36 feet that would take eight people with outstretched hands to surround it. Aren't there trees that like, can drive through? Yeah, they're big. Here's what the seed cones look like on a pine tree. And have you ever seen the pollen cones? These are the male cones. If you see a pine cone, that's a female cone. That holds the eggs and will eventually make the seeds. The male cones are these, the pollen cones, and, and they produce pollen grains. And then when they fall from the tree, they're about that long, and you can pick them up and kind of go like that, and they just come apart. You know those things? Those are male cones. That's what the male cones of a pine tree are like. There's my sister and my cousin by a redwood tree in Los Angeles. Long time ago. 
I didn't go. I've never seen one live. That looks bigger than having eight people around it. Yeah, especially if they're as small as my sister and my cousin. Um, those trees are huge. They live for like 3,000 years. They produce cones that are like that big. Somebody brought me one one time, and I was like, can I keep it now? Like, no. My mom was going to run it. Yeah. They're like two feet long. Did it kill somebody? A pine? One of those yeah. cones? I don't know if they're that heavy, because they, you know, they're yeah. spread out, so. They might cut them. They might cut them. There's a class next to a Christmas tree. That's conifer. Spruce or fir. Trees or conifer. Bro, can you go back? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Was that this year? Yeah, that was last year. I didn't see that. Okay, finally the flowering plants. The flowering plants evolved very recently. They're the most recent type of plant to evolve, anthophyta. That's why we do them last. They, uh, they came up with flowers <coughs> to produce their pollen grains. And the thing about flowers is, flowers utilize insects or some other pollinator to help them move their pollen. If you think about a pine tree, if a pine tree is going to get sperm from one tree to another tree, it's got to be blown by the wind. And so to, for, a, for a pollen grain to get from, from, one, from the male cone of one tree into the female cone on another tree, it's got to be really lucky. So to ensure that that happens, trillions and trillions of pollen grains have to be produced to assure that just a few of them get into a, the, the cone of another tree. It's very wasteful to do that, to produce so much pollen. I mean, it gets everywhere. Most of the pollen grains just die. Um, so the, uh, the flowering plants came up with a way that the pollen grains can be produced in very small amounts, but can be transported by insects. What they do is they make a flower and the flower has some kind of food reward. We call it nectar. And the insect comes up to eat the nectar. And when the insect is crawling around the flower eating the sweet nectar at the base of the flower, it gets pollen all over its body. It doesn't even know it. But pollen grains stick to the fur on a bee's body. And then the bee goes to another plant, maybe far away, and lands on it and starts eating its nectar and some of the pollen rubs off the bee's body onto the female parts of that plant. So, flowering plants have a way of moving the pollen from one plant to another without producing a lot of it. And that's an advantage. And so, 130 million years ago, when flowering plants first appeared, they had an advantage over all the conifers in that they didn't have to produce so much pollen, which is wasteful, and they kind of took over. And so now there are more species of flowering plants than anything else. Most, again, you look out the window, most of the green stuff you see is flowering plants. All the grasses are flowering plants. Most of the bushes, almost all the bushes are flowering plants, except for like the sago palms. Yes? May I ask questions? Yes, good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> We classify anthophyta as monocots, dicots, or eudicots. You may have heard that before. Mm -hmm. Monocots are your grasses, and eudicots are, uh, are your um, other types that have leaves that, that have branching veins. We're going to learn about monocots, dicots, and eudicots in a later chapter, more specifically. Flowering plants come in annuals. That's a, a, an annual plant lives for one year. It doesn't say that. The biennials live for two years, and perennial plants live for many years. So there's kind of different groupings, um, and you can you'll see these if you go buy flowers uh, at a nursery. It'll say annuals, 
biennials and perennials. If you're going to plant an annual, it's only going to live for one year. But often they're the real pretty ones. So, um, so that's anthophyta. So, are most plants for like? Because I thought you could keep a plant alive if you just like water it and get enough sun. A perennial plant you can, but an annual plant is programmed to grow, produce its flowers, produce its seeds, and then die all in the same year. So and nothing you can do will keep it alive. Most plants are perennial plants. Um, most weeds are annuals or biennials. Weeds. Most other types of plants are perennials. Okay, so read the section 21.4. <coughs> Tomorrow we'll do a lab. Yes, lab. Biography Thursday. Yes, Monday. So Friday we're not going to be here because what? The parade. The parade. There's a parade. Not all your class, but like I think like half of it. More than half of your class will be Can we leave at two o'clock? Oh. Can I turn it off? So let's do the let's do the test on Monday. Yeah. Okay. Say okay. Myself, please. Yes. Turn it off. Will us out. We don't have time for the picture, unfortunately. We'll have